Hi, everybody, and welcome back to Privacy Kitchen. I'm absolutely delighted to have Chris Roberts and Dave Wiley here. Uh, we've worked together on different uh, projects in the past, and I'm delighted to bring their wealth of experience and knowledge uh, to Privacy Kitchen viewers in for this fantastic um, session on moving privacy compliance from Sheet to SaaS. Now, obviously, you'd expect me to say that, but um, we'll get into why this is really a thing right now. So if I could um, ask maybe, uh, Dave, do you want to introduce yourself first? Hi, uh, I'm Dave Wiley of Compliance Clarity. Um, we basically uh, help organizations and companies understand their data protection programs through uh, audit uh, to remediation activities, whether that's through consulting, uh, individual uh, audits, and or moving towards the privacy office and or data protection as a service type function. Great, and Chris, you want to do a quick intro? Yeah, thank you very much, Robert. So Cybata helps organizations on that journey of uh, GDPR compliance. We'll be the range of organizations across uh, different sectors, including sporting, charity, uh, education, and uh, general business. So really it's yep. trying to make the language simple for people to understand uh, that they can take the right practical steps. Fantastic. And that's why I'm delighted to have you both on Privacy Kitchen, because Privacy Kitchen is all about helping people operationalize privacy uh, and the related security bit. So the topic today is moving privacy compliance from Sheet to SaaS. And I've just got up here the Cisco, their, their data privacy benchmark study is always a fantastic one. And their 2022 study, 90% of the 4,000 odd cust uh, people who responded said customers would not buy from them if they didn't adequately protect their data. Um, 92 said privacy is integral to their culture. Um, we've got here that 94% get reported to the board on privacy, at least one privacy metric will come onto that. And what I felt was really interesting, and it matches our uh, personas that we've seen in the marketplace, is that 90% of the time, the people looking after privacy are IT, 37%, security, 34%, compliance 11 percent ops eight percent and so you've got 90 percent of people there's that they're, they're professionals in their own right but they're not professionals in privacy and i think that potentially uh, is something we can come back to in, in this conversation so so going from sheet sheet to SaaS, we're, we're calling it why is that and why is that something now uh, in the current market maybe maybe chris you want to take us off on that one you know, I think we're, we're seeing a lot of customers who've tried to implement something in their business. So they've got some people have got Word documents that try to describe uh, yeah. what they've been doing. And we've seen people with, with simply PowerPoint slides that try to describe the, the position they have in regarding the data that they collect, where yeah. they store it and who they might share it with. The vast majority of people we see are storing on a sheet, you know, a Google yes. sheet, an Excel spreadsheet that seems to predominate, but I have seen the others. And it's an interesting take. Um, they'll have their documents that are relating to the topic on some SharePoint folder somewhere else. They'll have um, other information, policies, process and procedures somewhere else. So it's disparate. It's just not coherent. And I think one of the things that we're beginning to see is people realizing that this is a, a, a big topic and everything needs to be organized and structured. Uh, and be that in, in whatever system that is, it needs to be structured and coordinated. And I think for us, uh, one of the deep key DPOs we worked with when we've implemented a platform like this said, for him, it was much more than a document management system. Um, it allows him now, he's, it surfaces all of the GDPR problems, the data risks he's got very easily. Whereas previously yeah. he had all of that information buried in spreadsheets and he said, but the, the information is probably there, but I need to know it's probably there to be and go looking for it for it to become visible. Yeah. So for me, it's about being structured and then being able to get that, the information you need so you can make good management decisions. Absolutely. And, and, and Dave, how do you do you find the same? And also, I know you guys work a lot together, but do you find the same? And also uh, that that is where most people are at the moment? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think those that um, those bigger organisations that are, are quite sort of compliance focused, uh, whether it be PCI DSS, whether it be regulatory yeah. financial, whether it be gambling uh, commission uh, oversight and things like that, they generally understand the concept of you know uh, complying to regulations and what needs to be done to to meet the objectives. Yeah, the smaller companies when it comes to um, you know privacy and data protection aspects tend to be far less understand well have far less understanding in terms of what they should be doing it, it's a it's a maturity thing um 
very much like health and safety when it first came out. Everyone thought it was a kickbox exercise. And, you know, over the years, it's morphed into, you know, a lot, a lot bigger um, function in terms of what you need to do and, and how you embed it into your, into your business. We're seeing the same type of thing start to happen in the uh, data protection space in terms of organizations have had their first kind of stab of it um, when it came up to the implementation of the, uh, uh, the, the fine aspect when it went live, which obviously got everyone um, sort of concerned. To, to now where we're seeing more of a kind of a, an effect of what we call the supply chain effect on things. So customers um, that they have either within the business now and or um, clients that they're trying to win the business of is generally driving the kind of push now from this, what I call um, semi-organized chaos more to a, a, a structured, organized, methodical way to operational yeah. um, data protection. So that's yeah. kind of thing now so that's a big driver with, with, with and, and and from from my side i'm seeing this as well so i i've i've um i've got a slide that i i talked to people about where you can see the google search results for gdpr software in the uk and they, and they're up they're going up to the right at the beginning in 2018 and they fall off a cliff uh halfway through 18 when everyone goes okay let's wait and see what happens and there are all those myths about we're too small it doesn't apply to us all this sort of stuff um or it's like y2k it'll blow over and then when the market was going we've really got to do this because of what you said about the fact that the the sort of fines in gdpr are basically driven board risk driven if you did anything with public sector like you say health we mentioned earlier um it's all in audits for financial services every single financial services company and at the beginning of 2020 everyone was going right we actually do need to do something uh proper about this and then lockdown happened and those security it ops compliance people who deal with it were all off doing remote working and furlough and so um there's been a sort of a couple of years and we've seen really and since sort of July last year, it's really started coming through as those people have looked at what they did before and gone, we really didn't know what we were doing then. We know we didn't and we need something a bit a bit more now. Uh, the way does I that catch, ring a bell? The, yeah, the, I mean, the way I capture it, it, I call it a veneer of respectability many organisations yeah. put in. What, the, what they heard around 2017 yeah. and 18 was they heard two things predominantly. From, particularly from the legal a lot of legal firms presentations was we need to go and get consent for to talk to our customers and the second thing is we need a privacy notice so what we saw was a lot of people go and put a generic template privacy notice on the website so tick in the box that's done yep. go out and ask for consent even though you already had permission to talk to those clients and some then couldn't talk to them yep. so they made terrible mistakes around consent we're still seeing consent is being used for a lawful basis that really doesn't stack up so pretty much a lot of people still thought, well, that was us done. And yeah. for uh, Dave, in my view, that's less than 5% of what needs to be in their output. There are outputs from a yeah, lot yeah, of work yeah. it needs to do to understand what's going on about data collection. And you've got to be specific about the data when you start to map this and understand it because the devil is in the detail like most things. And I think that is, I couldn't agree more, the devil in the detail. I was just having a call this morning with a, with a, um, a startup actually, and you know, for funding, they've got to have a good GDPR answer because they're doing very, very uh, personal data processing, <laughs> sensitive data processing is their plan. And they've got to go from zero to 100 really quickly because while that two years of lockdown, let's talk about that. What, what are the big things that have happened in that? We talked about that sort of before lockdown. There was that GDPR trough, I call it. Then we had the great pandemic pause. And during the great pandemic pause, tons of stuff like Brexit, Schrems, you know, all the different fines, all this sort of stuff came through. And what I say is we're now in this sort of period of the great adoption, both for GDPR as a whole and also for, for GDPR SaaS. But can you talk us through what happened in those couple of years? Dave, if we start with you, what sort of during that great pandemic pause, it only just got more and more important to deal with it, didn't it? It, it did. I mean, um, to, to go back to kind of the beginning of it, I think there was a blind panic. Um, yep. I saw it in my uh, business where, you know, in-flight, um, you know, customers and, you know, those that are in the, in the pipeline to come on board basically just stopped pretty much everything overnight. It was a classic um, defense position. Everyone was yep. like, can't, can't do anything. You know, all the money's gone. We've got to basically go into survival mode. Yeah, We saw that for quite a long time. Um in terms of you know where where things are coming out now, I think people are still being to quite a fair degree concentrating on building and recovering their core kind of service offering. There's been a lot of um, you know um, yeah. 
redundancies and things like that. Things are starting to come back. I would say it's still not as quick as I thought it was going to be. Um, so there's still kind of a, a lag element. And I think, mm. you know, with a lot of what's going on in terms of the stop start of the pandemic and things like that, yeah. are we coming out, are we not coming out, you know, all those type of things have contributed to the general kind of uh, malaise and wait and see. But, you know, that aside, generally what we are now seeing is the um, the bigger organizations out there that are, are, are more kind of mature and, and on top of their programs, they've moved from a, what I call the kind of project program phase more into the BAU operational phase. So they're becoming yeah. far more proactive in terms of instigating uh, things like vendor due diligence and things like that. Yeah, yeah, so we're yeah. starting to see that really forcing the, the kind of recovery with the smallest sort of supply chain element of it, whether you're a controller yeah. or a processor undertaking services on on those particular larger companies' uh, behalf. So that's where we're really kind of seeing the uh, impetus. And also to combine that with the whole international transfer side of things with Brexit, you know, the IDTAs and all those type of things coming, that's kind of very much the focus area. It's around that data sort of transfer, where things are going and, and who in your supply chain is implicated yeah. in this. <clears throat> Absolutely. We saw something slightly different. We saw number of sectors that rely on government funding and they were three-year programs or five-year programs and they decided that they couldn't do the front-facing part of their activity working with their sports or working with their, their charity clients in, in the ways they were and, and a number of them said to us let's let's spend the time and money on the back office functions let's start getting our data protection and our cyber security yeah. to the place we've really wanted it to be but there's always something more important that we need to mm. do so throughout the lockdown we, we were quite lucky in the fact that we had quite a lot of customers actually uh, made it very busy for us while some more of the, uh, the, the, the the in other sectors that that dropped off a cliff uh, for the reason so that's, that a, that's a great point so let's talk about the sectors now that's a great point to talk about them so how would you see the different <coughs> sectors now? Um, how would you judge them in terms of their appetite on privacy compliance and just anyway, let, let alone how they actually do it? So, so I think for me, we still have across a number of sectors uh, and a, a lack of knowledge. For me, information is knowledge is power. How can a board of directors, a trustees make good business decisions if there isn't that? good quality information to help them understand what this what what the gdpr is what the risks yeah. are what their responsibilities are so i still think but it's like any other piece of new regulation it takes time some people will always be at the front end there they adopt it very quickly because it's the right thing to do there'll be others at the end of the spec the other end of the spectrum the flat earth society the earth is flat no matter what they hear and everyone else is on a spectrum in between so so certainly we've seen education is the thing that that is really important yeah yeah in terms of sectors we see some very what well, i characterize them as complex data complexity is the thing that drives it for me so i see the in sectors where a lot of personal data is being collected of a sensitive nature often charities sporting organizations education and health yeah are what i call very data complex sectors. Yep. Um, now, unfortunately, some of those are more data complex and they're relatively small organizations. So we do get what you said earlier on. It's too small for me, but we're actually seeing some breakthroughs now. They're beginning to realize mm -hmm. um, with a, the language and the terminology that we use that actually we may be small in size, but actually uh, the amount of data we collect from a large number of data subjects, that's very sensitive data, including adults and children, and our supply chain to deliver that is very complex. Mm -hmm. And the funding channels to be able to enable us to do this are very complex. So the legal relationships between the organizations are very complex. It's beginning to be understood. So there are sectors where you think, you know, sport, for example, you know, who would think sport is complex? Well, they have two massive threats. They have the fact that uh, you look at the NCSC, they're under normal uh, threats from cyber attacks, the sports sector, as any other industry. But because of WADA and the doping issues six years ago, fancy bear Russian hackers are going out to sports or to embarrass them by extracting data that can be embarrassing. Right, right. So they have two threats. And then the data side, we've got now an organization, a number of lawyers have got together working with sportsmen to challenge sporting organizations around the value of their data. Because the sportsmen are saying now, my data is valued, it should be mine. Uh, the sports organization is using it for their benefit. 
and that's going to be challenged in court. So the value of their data has been raised, then the value of the or the importance of the security underneath that is being raised. So again, who would have thought it? Sport. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. And and Dave, how, how have you? Does that ring with you? I mean, I know you you work a lot together, but also different industries as well. How do you see the the patchwork at the moment? Yeah, um, I think I can mirror quite a lot of what Chris is saying. Um, in terms of the um, specific sector, I, I do some work in the uh, gaming and gambling sector for uh, land-based yeah. uh, casinos. And um, obviously they were affected by a shutdown. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so went through that kind of uh, same same process of um, yeah, yeah, stagnation, I suppose, is the best way, um, and furlough. Um, but in terms of sort of moving forward, um, things are getting better. Uh, they are definitely going in the right direction. Um, the other sort of sector that we're, we're starting to see is, um, I mean, Chris has touched on it on the, on the health side of things. We're beginning to see quite a lot of, um, you know, post um, stagnation uh, merger and acquisition starting to happen. Um, yeah. So yeah. that's starting to uh, highlight some um, concerns and issues around either the acquiring parties, um, ability to consume that entity themselves because their program isn't very mature versus the maturity of the entity they're sort of acquiring and the state that that's in so you know there we're seeing a bit of an uptick in, in there and then going back to the kind of the earlier sort of a comment about the supply chain impact obviously when you're dealing with sort of health and uh, clinical commissioning groups and their supply chains the whole kind of NHS DSP toolkit aspect comes yes. in, DTAC and uh, uh, C plus and all those type of things. So again, it's starting to kind of really sort of come together um, in terms of, the, you know, the, the real pushes is, is very much the supply chain, regardless of kind of the sector that you're seeing. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we're definitely- That's, that's a good so, so, so there was um, an interesting study by um, Clause Match, which is actually another one of our partners. They, they, looked at the adoption of regtech and they said that during the lockdown period what remote working did was it horizontalized the adoption of different technologies because before you know people needed to collaborate more and cloud is just inherently collaborative mm -hmm. and so it's accelerated we've all heard you know five years of digitization and, and digital acceleration in a year or whatever it was but certainly you can see in this survey it really has just as you both said really it's gone away from just finance and tech who are always the early adopters. It's now with those two years of lockdown, that's another effect we've seen. You know, we're talking with, you know, publishers, gaming companies, like you say, uh, all sorts of different companies, manufacturers and what have you. So it definitely has come through because I think also Schrems too, and the recent Google Analytics cases have really um, uh, uh, moved people along. So when you, when you mentioned, Dave, at that point about acquiring a company, um, one of your clients acquiring companies and how do you absorb those? And so that's a good point to ask where you guys have, you guys have put together this sort of sheet to SaaS offering to, to go and work together to get customers from, um, which is basically where everybody is at the moment. Everybody, there's 28 million companies in Europe. Even the largest player says they've max got 10,000 customers. They're not all on, on the management product. So this is like, to, I always say it's a herd of elephants that's just waking up really. And we're just fleas on the back of the elephants. It's just a massive way to go at the very beginning, which is super exciting. Um, so in terms of that, how did you look at it and go, now's the right time to go, okay, SaaS is here. Is it that when you were doing different projects before you've been going, there should be a tool for this and tools are now ready? Is it because it, you, you hit something like that, acquiring a company and said, actually SaaS would be good here. Can you, can you talk us through whichever one you want to take this about how you've cr come up with the sheet SaaS program that you get, you're, you're rolling out? I think Dave's a good starter and I can, I can take the story forward, I think. Yeah, um, so so for me, in, in my kind of day-to-day -day activities as a data protection consultant, obviously you work with loads of different organizations and they're all at different stages of their journey. Yeah. You come across lots of different tools and methodologies and, and the way to, uh, to kind of run their program either on their behalf or by giving them advice uh, as to what they kind of should be doing uh, to get kind yeah. of better bang for their buck rather than just paying your consultancy fee. They're actually getting kind of something out of it. So what I was seeing was a, it was quite a lot of commonality in terms of uh, the kind of stage of the journey and what they were trying to achieve. In other words, yeah. going from chaos to some sort of order. Um, 
So when it comes to any um, specific uh, software tool, um, whether it's in the privacy management space or anything other, you basically have to go down a journey to get it from uh, this kind of concept to actual physically using it. So there's yep. quite a find a uh, kind of process that you go through some of it is very formulaic some of it is kind of a bit fly by the you know fly by the seat of your yeah. hat depending on the organization's ability to kind of uh, go through that process uh, and you know and the experience of either the people that are working in the startup and or you know the the complexity and the size of the organization um so basically what, what i came up with is is that there was a there was a common kind of stepwise approach that you could pretty much follow regardless of an organization size uh, you know the, the the vertical they were in and or um, you know the the solution that they need needed to deploy in the end so there's these kind of vendor products that are out there the so-called SaaS vendor solutions of which yours is a good example of one um you know to going through that whole kind of journey so we kind of standardized the uh, the approach and the yeah and basically said, right, this is the framework and this is how we would deploy it for this particular organization in this particular sector, uh, this particular size, and this is kind of the outcome solution. So that's kind of the a mindset of doing it is just getting it standardized and then just following yeah. it on the, the kind of requirements of the end client. Makes total sense. Makes total I, sense. I think from, from one, like one of the practical examples we've deployed in a, a, an organization, a DPO I highly respect, um, I work a lot in that sector and um, he's got responsibility for his own organization, but also the wider sector as well. Um, and the challenge he was facing is that he ends up being the DP, he's the DPO, but he ends up doing more of the, the, the what we call the privacy office work, the doing yeah. rather than yeah. the advising. Yeah. And, and he wants to build his team, the, the managers in that organization to take responsibility for data and cyber within their business functions, alongside the financial responsibilities they have, the health and safety mm. responsibilities they have, and all the other things. So, so he looked at uh, the platforms, a whole range of features across the different platforms, selected a platform, and then that's where I came in. So it was now, okay, we want to take him on that journey to implement the platform. Yeah, now, yeah, over yeah. my long, long career, I'm old and grey, as you can see. Um, I've implemented a lot of platforms. Dave's laughing see... at us. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, I'm not that far behind you guys. <laughs> <laughs> so so we, we, I know that if you implement a platform without um, the right structure, the platform ends up being delivered, customer doesn't use it for 12 months, and it gets thrown in the bin, and the technology yeah. gets blamed. So there, yeah. there's, a, there's a good some good learnings we've had. So we first of all took uh, the model that Dave talked about, which Dave created initially, and I walked through this the, the model with the client. So we we did the, the the discovery phase, which is understanding what information he's actually got in place. Then we when we look at the um, at the preparation phase, which is making sure standardization nomenclature. It sounds very dull and boring, but if you get mm -hmm. everything right in their existing framework, you find that different people in the organization call the same process something different. Well, let's let's fix mm -hmm. all that at, at source in, in, the, in the sheet. And then we know yep. we're happy. Yeah, that's a good picture. Still a few holes, but it, it's, it's gone to, a point, let's say, 80% out of the 100% because we're going to put it into a SaaS platform, so we don't need that 20% yet. Let's get it pretty good. Yeah, yeah. The import process can vary across the different SaaS platforms, yep. but that's usually not the biggest part of the process. Actually, the preparation is. Yep. Prior preparation prevents, we know, poor performance. So yep. get that right. The import is usually very fairly straightforward. And then it's about you know customizing the platform. So linking the right parameters, um, filling in some of the, the gaps which can't be done through import. Uh, and they've got a platform then which you can train the operators in. Now in this client, he got his staff so excited they wanted to be trained on the platform without their data in it. Now, for me, it's dangerous because they can't visualize the context. It's the context that's missing. The contextual yeah. stuff is really, really important. So we held them off, yeah. did the import, did the uh, uh, customization, and then trade them. And guess what? It's boom. Oh, all our own language, all our own terminology yeah. that we work with every day is in that platform. And so the DPO said after we said, look, this platform's amazing. I, I thought it was going to be a glorified document management system. It was going to be the three things he had in his mind, and the platform was far more than that. He yeah. said, you know what this platform's given me? It's the ability to surface very, very easily all of the data protection risks I should be focusing on. 
and actually they were probably buried in the spreadsheet I had, but it's very hard to find. You've almost got to um, have a hypothesis, something is a problem, and then go digging for it, and you can probably find it. He said, but this just surfaces it naturally. And, and that's the, the other, yeah, yeah. The last thing he's been able to do then is now he's been able to start doing his real job because his team now write the DPIAs within the platform, yeah. and he just yeah. bounces back the things that they may have forgotten and, and and moving it to a place. So he's on a on a fast track journey now. I think that's right, and I think you know before using SaaS, which most organisations in the world are, not, very very few as a percentage are actually using privacy management SaaS, but. When you use a dedicated SaaS, or before you use it, as you say, we've talked about Word documents in some places, Excel documents, diagrams, what have you. Um, maybe there's version control stuff going on. Maybe they're in particular locations. They're not on a drive. They're in a local machine. Um, someone's left who's got loads of information in their head. Always happens. Um, and then when people want to report, how do you do that report? How do you pull that report out? And you know, I'm, I, when I found it keepable before doing so i was doing this lean startup consulting approach and i was building out the prototypes and the and the um and the mvps myself and sort of spreadsheets and google sheets and stuff i had scoring engines everywhere and pulling this here and that. and so it's just you know it's a bit like saying you can do sales with spreadsheet but you know hubspot makes it easier you can do you know you can do finance with a spreadsheet but zero just makes things easier and it it just as you say it frees people up Everything's in one place. They can collaborate. It frees up their time. Heavy lifting should be done for them. So that's great to hear that that DPOs that DPOs felt that. And so the so the benefits. Can you just confirm that those benefits when you've seen people move? If you can contrast how how the customers are acting, how they react to questions about um, uh, you know, can you provide this report to us where your Article Thirties, etc. Can you compare how they are before they take on? A SaaS product to afterwards, not from a point of view of, and I say this as a SaaS vendor, but the we're the we're the we're the sort of goalkeeper in this. It's you guys and the customer because it's people, processes, and technology. So, you know, the technology enables, and it should bring some joy to people. Hopefully, uh, we're trying to put the joy in compliance. But the main thing is about how the people are working, how the processes are working. So, without really talking about the technology side, can you focus about how the people are finding it different and how the processes are different when they've got it automated with the technology uh, yeah i think you know dave and i were actually talking about this absolutely this morning um i think we and we touched on it earlier about the veneer of respectability a privacy notice being in place um but you know the uh, the data subjects will typically look at privacy notices for information from an organization you look at regulator may if the icr are involved they may well look at those mm -hmm. the other piece of information is the article 30 where the legal firms will look at that the regulator will look at that so they're they're really your your main touch points from an external perspective but you know to get this right for a customer to understand what their level of risk is for dave and i it's clear it's the record of processing activity is the thing you have to really invest the time and money in right and that's where a SaaS platform comes in because today what we find is, I certainly find, they've got bits of information all over the place. Someone's got a bit of knowledge. Someone else has got a bit of knowledge. It's on a different plate. It's not coherent and it's not structured. And I think that's yeah, what yeah. we come back to every single time. So if they have to respond to a DSAR, they spend so much time running around, asking for information, getting together, meetings. If, they, if that information was in the SaaS platform from the, uh, from the beginning, all of that initial work was carried out and it's all in there. Then 90% of the way through being able to respond to the ICO and all the data subject very yeah. quickly. And what we've seen is, like any other process, your first interaction with someone often sets the tone for the rest of the interaction. So if you take a long time to respond to the data subject, or if you talk to the ICO and you look incompetent and you're unable to answer their initial questions, what will the ICO do? typically yeah. start pushing you towards the enforcement team. So, you know, if you've got this information in a SaaS platform, nice and structured, it may not be perfect. It may not be the level of detail that really ultimately is needed. Most people go, okay, they've got this under control mm -hmm. and you can work on the minor details that are missing or not quite complete. But usually people who don't have a SaaS, if they're put under that pressure from an external person, it's not coherent and it doesn't look professional. And I think that just puts the organization under under more stress than it needs to be. Dave, I don't know what you yeah. think. Yeah, I think I'd agree with that uh, a lot. And the way I see it is the Europa is kind of, the, you know, the, the core of your kind of data protection uh, program. Mm -hmm. And, you know, 
unless you've done all the kind of uh, upstream activities to do the discovery and getting everything in there, um, you know, the, the quality of those kind of um, outside in type artifacts, as Chris has said, whether it's the Article 30, the privacy notice, point in time notice, it's probably going to be quite poor because you've you've created those without full understanding. So again, it's that veneer of respectability. So by yeah. having a structured approach and putting everything into a kind of very logical um, kind of work step flow of getting that from a you know a chaotic state into a SaaS uh, specific solution, then allows um, you know the operational side of um, data protection to become far more um, easy uh, on the internal privacy office that are managing it you know the responsible um uh, people within the business the dpo obviously that's got kind of yes. oversight and responsibility for it but then and then all the sort of external parties it becomes much easier to to respond to those vendor due diligence questionnaires because you know a lot of the stuff is going to be in there and if you're even very mature what i'm starting to say to customers is use that to start basically being proactive with your vendor due diligence stuff put it out on your website with a standard vendor due diligence like template and saying please go and have a look there and if you can't then find the information you require that's you know you want more then come back to us in other words it's like that self-help self-feed rather than send everything to us and you've got 35 different vendor assessments you're trying to deal with and they're all different formats and uh, you can basically say to everyone go and get it yourself we've done it we've been proactive uh, and again yeah. some of the vendor solutions some kind of facilitate that natively within them some you can derive that information and then put it on your external um, website and stuff but yeah that's a uh, you know all the all the aspects that we're trying to get you know the, the kind of do once possibly twice but then get multiple yeah. downstream benefits out of it um <clears throat> exactly where the system really helps <clears throat> I think the other thing exactly. that just come to my mind is that you know we've had clients come to us and said this is the problem we've got in in data protection. Can you come and help us? And we'll go in and have the discovery. And and actually, when you go and build the record of processing activity, what they thought was a high risk issue is a medium risk issue. There's three other things which are high or very high risk issues. Right. So they were about to spend a huge amount of time and resource on something which they thought was high risk, the problem. And actually, by helping them build their picture of their complete data processing environment mm, mm, mm. and document the rubber it was clear to them very clear to their board we're fo we were about to focus the wrong resources and effort on the wrong things these are the yeah. three things we focus on first i think that's right there's um there's been a big move from sort of 40 page documents you'd put on desk and say there's my work output you know that's a good job done so now sort of red amber green you know having a real sort of signal visual uh, representation and we've we've some of our customers they've 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 they you know they're exactly what you said earlier about audits we've we've had customers going yeah, we've we've gone through audits using saas and it's really helped with the auditor going i know you're not 100% who is i know you're not 100% but i know you know where you're going and you've got a good answer like you were saying earlier and then also actually we've had people coming to us going actually our auditors have said you've got to get saas for this because it's just a mess <laughs> so Obviously, it depends on the size of company, um, but that that is something that that we're definitely hearing. Um, and times with me, Robert, one of our DPOs again had a, the one of the big four auditors in, and they went through it, and he showed them the platform that was deployed. And yeah, it, it, I think they didn't go into more detail in other areas they might have done in the, perhaps in the past because it was so clearly different and ahead of yeah. what everyone else was doing yeah. it always makes the audit very easy and simple for them because all the days are and they go they go more quickly which means they're less likely to lift a rock where you yeah. may have a problem yeah i think that's i think one of the good things about it is it forces you to look at various different bits that you wouldn't necessarily like you were saying they were looking at one area instead of another but also you know, for example, we have a button you click, you just get default activities in. So you've instantly got a data map and an article 30 record. Now it's not complete, but you, it covers a lot of things like recruiting and payroll and sort of thing. And so just having an answer instead of no answer is a great thing. Having that visibility of where everything is, is a great thing. So in terms of, um, and we, you know, the, the, we've talked about all these different benefits and what people, what it's like before the, the move through the last couple of years in particular, the need for people to really get that revenue because the economies are starting to creep up, but there's coming from a very low base. And as you say, there's been a lot of pain out there and people are desperate to get the work in. So they want to support that as much as possible. 
they don't want to be spending the time doing this. And actually rapidity acceleration is another thing uh, that helps here. So if they are looking to choose a SaaS provider, and obviously uh, you know, we're not going to name any, but the sort of factors about when they're looking for a SaaS provider to help manage the privacy situation. Um, Dave, do you want to kick us off with sort of the sort of things that they should be looking at, how they go about it, um, the process? Yeah, um, so like anything, um, there's all, all different vendors out there. I mean, we're seeing an explosion in, a, in sort of privacy management software out there, um, uh, no doubt. And um, I, I suppose the one thing that I suppose is key to, to any organization is understanding what their, um, their, their budget is, um, because yep, all, yep. all the software platforms have uh, different pricing models. Um, they're generally starting to standardize them towards their approach in terms of where they're going. Um, and they're obviously some are aimed at you know the SME market, some are, are mid tier, yeah, and some yeah, are yeah. kind of enterprise. Some allow pretty much any uh, market to to basically become a customer. But you're still going to have the same issues of you know you've got to a understand what you're looking for and b go through that kind of selection and that whole kind of onboarding process and configuration and output. So regardless of the size, you're still going to have those same kind of key concerns that you need to go through. Um, yeah. So that's kind of the, my perception of, of, of where we're seeing it. So in terms of how they go about selecting, um, we're finding there's kind of two different uh, scenarios. Some businesses very much just come to us and say, well, you guys are the expert. What, in your opinion, based on our sector and our size um, and or complexity, yeah. as was mentioned, do you think is suitable? Uh, and we can make quite a quick judgment call normally on that and say, well, you know, we would recommend X over Y. Um, in other slightly bigger organizations, um, you know, the, the, the process becomes not only us giving sort of consulting advice and guidance on, on which solutions, but they then have to go through a, a three vendor, um, you know, selection process and all that kind of standard. So, you know, that's kind of generally the two approaches, um, depending on, you know, the, the, the size. Yeah. Uh, but, but generally, whatever the, the way that that goes, um, you know, our whole kind of model of advice you know that whole kind of process the five-step process as we call it to kind of doing doing the doing and then having that sort of output at the end it you know we can do that regardless of absolutely that. i think that, that you know as a vendor i'm the first to say that we all have different product philosophies yeah. and we all have different um strategies and aims and different um, benefits and weaknesses and it is really key that people do it is people process than technology so they should really work with consultants work with people who know about it and say what do you think about us and then try them out please just try them out because the number of people you speak to we just went with one without looking at any others and then we're like oh my gosh this isn't really what i wanted um so just try them out definitely chris do you want to uh yeah i mean i i, I always the rule of three always applies to me and, and my customers but what what is interesting i'm the co-lead of a data privacy uh, we've just renamed it, so I can't even remember the name, across all of Wales. Um, and we put a questionnaire out to people on all a whole range of things that they were interested, would be interested in us doing monthly webinars. And the top two things that came back was data ethics. We want to know, people wanting to know more about that, but also it was how to select a GDPR SaaS platform, right. which, is, which, which surprised me a little bit because yeah. we've been talking about how the market has changed and, and that was that was predominated uh, the the responses. So um, we'll be going through a session with them and saying, you know, what are you looking for? Again, it's about complexity of yeah. your organisation. It's about your starting point, your level of maturity. It's about how do you operate as a business as well. And that that comes into play yep, yep. as well. You know, yeah, how much you're prepared to invest as well, because there is a range of, of monthly prices on these platforms. And there's no two bones about it. And so it's all of these things have to go into that melting pot. And you know. Uh, say to clients like anything you know wh whether it's this type of platform or buying or any any SaaS platform in the in the marketplace we've said you we've always bought on price it's got to be in your budget otherwise you're not going to buy why are you looking yeah. at it it's got to do the things you want it to do the, the functionality now we've always done that sounds so simple <laughs> it is but, but it's true it's very true it is. And now I said to people, if they're buying a HR platform, buying, buying a GDPR platform, buying a finance platform, there are two extra things you have to do. You have to look at the GDPR compliance of the organization you're buying it from. Yeah. You need to look at the cybersecurity measures that business employs. Yeah. And you have to look at the platform you're buying to understand the security measures and the GDPR friendly yeah. features of that platform. 
because okay. there's no I, I took a client down uh, 11th hour they asked me to do a due diligence on a on a training platform they'd spent 11 months working on this right price because they got a massive discount on the platform they did the things they wanted to do and, the, and i went in and within an hour i killed the project there was there was no mfa and it's a public yeah. platform for training and they were right. so we said okay well how can we fix this we'll look at third-party authentication that came out four times the cost of the platform so that wasn't wow. in so they had to hire a software developer to cobble something together for over six months to make the platform fit for purpose now if they had looked at those features and all those four areas at the beginning and with five, across five or six vendors and mm -hmm. one of them couldn't do the, the security so they're out you know one of them couldn't do the finance because it was too expensive but had the right features you know they'd have come up with two or three that could do all of those things yeah. and then it was down to that nego final negotiation but so That's we're still that. having the problem so i would say to anyone go to all of the vendors select three ask them all of the due diligence questions you'd be asking any other vendor yeah yeah absolutely i mean we we, we, it's, it's interesting. We get asked a lot more now. I mean, we've just gone through a massive forensification project for about a year. Um, so we, it's, 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 yeah, we get asked all the time and we're in G cloud as well. So it's, we're used to that, but um, I thought we, we could, we're coming into the last couple of minutes and I thought I'd return to the Cisco study and 2022, the study said the same thing as 2021, about six areas where people were getting significant or very significant benefits. So significant or very significant. And this has been broadly consistent for the past two years, they say. Um, so the lowest figure here is 63%, the highest is 71%. They're all about sort of 68% in the middle, really. Benefits, significant benefits or very significant benefits from privacy expenditure. Doesn't say what type of expenditure, but investing in privacy. Loyalty and trust is the top one. A more attractive company is the second one at 70%. Operational efficiency, agility and innovation, mitigation, mitigating security losses, and reducing sales delays. Now, those all sound like benefits every single organization should be wanting to get. Are those benefits ringing with you in terms of when people have got a good answer in place? It sounds like it from the conversation we've had. Yeah, I, I would say that you know a, a privacy SaaS platform um, that's correctly sourced and implemented and then managed going forward will provide quite a lot of those um, um, you know, ROIs, return on investments, I suppose, uh, in terms of operational efficiency, for sure. Um, one thing is key, though, that we, we know from experience is, you know, no solution off the shelf is, uh, you know, a panacea to uh, all your ills. If you don't, you know, embed it <laughs> into your business and manage it going forward, it doesn't matter if it's got all the bells and whistles, <laughs> it's going to be 100%. This is, so this is for privacy expenditure as a whole. Absolutely. Yeah. And as I say, it's people, processes, technology, Absolutely. get that knowledge in, get those processes going. That's all expenditure and investment in privacy. Absolutely. And then, yeah. Any one thing, investing in process procedures alone doesn't do it. Investing in a SaaS platform on its own doesn't. Investing in training, be it face-to-face -face or e-learning as a combo, that doesn't do it. it. It has to be the whole piece. And and again, that, that comes from the drive and the desire from the boards, the, the board of directors, the trustees, the execs. And, and I'm, I'm beginning to see a change where more are being more proactive, but I still think that is slower than it needs to be. Yeah. Some of the work we've seen where you know, Dev and I worked on projects where we put a million pound risk on a 25 million pound business because yeah. of the fact that they've got so many holes in there. And, and unless they fix yeah. those, if, there's, if they come to be acquired, and someone else does the same work, then they're not going to maximize the value of their business. So, you know, so, I think M&A so, will drive it and all these things. Yeah, absolutely. So, so we've come to, we've come to the end of time. So, um, so thank you so much, both of you, your details will be on the end slide on the beginning slide as well. So everyone can get in contact with you. And I do recommend people, we, people do, as you see, incredibly knowledgeable, practical, commercial, uh, advisors uh, you'd be lucky to have on your team so people do reach out uh, to Chris and to Dave as well and um, and I love the project the sheet to SAS we to I totally agree technology in its place people processes technology but it does lend that uh, efficiency across uh, so this will go up very shortly and I, it just reminds me to say thank you so much guys it was really great very enjoyable as always Robert thank you yeah thank you very much Robert and uh, thank you to all the audience as well thank you very much bye-bye bye-bye